Hello, everybody. I'm Skip Alzheimer, and welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show. Uh, we just watched uh, The Little Night, and there was some confusion, uh, and I'm going to clarify. Uh, one is, that was a silent film. Hello, everybody. Oh, hold on. I'm Skip Alzheimer, and welcome to That's the AV weird. Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show. Let me kill this. Hold on. Uh, we just watched... Oh, yeah, feedback loops. We love them. Okay, anyways, I'm back. Uh, so, um, yeah. So what I did, and, and some people guessed it, uh, is I when I scan a film, that's what you see is the entire uh, frame. Uh, and I'll, I'll switch over so you can see it. Um, so you see uh, this is 16 millimeter, and it's double sprocketed, so it's silent. Uh, to the right, you see the two sprockets. Um, that would be the sa where the soundtrack would be if it was optical or magnetic sound. And then on the left, you see two sprockets. And then you see K, and then you see a circle and a triangle. And then there's a square up there. So um, a lot of people were, were asking, like, what is this from? You know, occasionally uh, I like to show kind of what's you don't traditionally see because when you run this through a projector, the projector has has a gate and it has it basically blocks off all of the stuff beyond the frame. And there's information sometimes in that uh, beyond the frame in between the sprockets. And what we're seeing with the the circle and the triangle is what we call a date code, Kodak date code. So Kodak, um, they were always uh, dating their their film stock, and this gives you a rough idea of when the film was made, and specifically the film stock, not the um, when the film itself was exposed and developed, but like what batch it was made. And so um, there's little charts that are out in the world, and <clears throat> I know this is tiny. Uh, so we're looking for, if we wanted to see how old this film was, I guess they didn't want to actually put the year because that's too obvious. And they would have somebody, someone say like, hey, I bought this film. I thought it was new, but it was actually three years old. Um, okay, so it was a, a circle and a triangle. So we looked down the Rochester, where film in the United States was made for a long time. And we see under 1923 we see the circle and the triangle. So that's possible because 16 millimeter film came out in 1923, but also they would cycle the date, the, the date codes. So it could also have come out in 1943. And so, you know, and since this film was not originally shot on 16 and, and distributed on 16, it was 35, then it was cut down it's hard to say because there was a home market where they were distributing silent films. So I'm not sure when this film was distributed. <laughs> it was made. It could have been 23. It could have been 43. The quality of the film leads me to believe it could potentially be 43, even though I don't know if you noticed there was a weird kind of water moisture thing throughout the frame, uh, which is what happens if a film gets wet or damp is that sometimes you'll see that, or if it wasn't washed properly when it was processed. All right, so 1943, 1923, I'm, I'm not sure, hard to say, uh, although I'm leaning towards 43. Um, it's 80 geeks for a reason. <laughs> we just geeked out pretty hard looking at a chart. <coughs> but anyways, uh, it's it's sometimes really helpful to have that, that day code information, especially if you're trying to ID stuff. And that actually came up during the alien autopsy film, uh, where supposedly somebody got a hold of some film stock that was of a certain time and had shared the date code, and so they they shot the alien autopsy thing and pretended like it was from the fifties. But I don't either. They bought film stock from the fifties and shot it, or they bought from the early seventies and then they shot it in the. 80s or 90s, and then, you know, hoax. They perpetuated a hoax. So there you go. Anyways, let's learn about some everyday courtesy, because some of you probably don't care about date codes. So here we go.
And all you have to remember is it may be... Uh, What's really this? Difficult. Someone being Pretty discourteous cool. in the middle of a talk on courtesy? And all you have to remember is courtesy is just being considerate of other people. Oh? Isn't that right? It's right, but look around you. Is it considerate to bore your classmates? I guess not. Wouldn't it be more considerate if you made an extra effort to make your talk interesting to them? To pep it up a little? I guess so. But it sure is hard to be exciting with an audience like that. Well, now it's their turn to be courteous to you. A courteous listener, yes, you, Marty, tries to make it easier not more difficult for a speaker. Right. It's hard enough to be up here. I need all the help I can get from you people. That's much better. I suppose what I'm trying to say is courtesy is not just a bunch of rules that have to be followed, but a way of doing things to make it easier and more pleasant for everybody to get along. Let's see if Jeff's right. Let's see if that's what courtesy is really all about. Hey, Mark! <laughs> Jeff, I'd like you to meet Peggy and her brother, Ted. They've just moved here from New York. Pleased to meet you, Peggy. Ted, what's it like in New York? Well, well introducing the new students cool. does make it a little well, easier well, for them to begin making well. friends. Did you want me for anything special, Jeff? Well, I, uh... Just wondered if you could come to my house. Sure, after school? No, not today. May 24th, two weeks from Saturday. Uh, sure, I guess I can come. Early? About 12 o'clock. Oh, uh, well, should I have lunch at my house uh, before I come? No, uh, we'll have lunch at my house. Then my dad's taking us to the ball game. Great! Taking all of us? Well, uh, sure. Uh, everybody at the party. Party? You didn't say anything about a party. What party? Birthday party. Mine. Didn't I tell you that? No, you didn't, Jeff. And you could have made it easier for Mike if your invitation had been a little clearer. Gee, I thought I told you. Say, maybe you'd like to come too? Well, uh, Jeff? And perhaps it would make it a little easier for a newcomer to reply to an invitation if he felt he was really wanted. Why don't you try again, Jeff? Sound a little more like you mean it. Be a great chance for you to meet some of my friends, Ted. Gee, Peggy, I'm sorry you can't come, but this party's only for boys. I'd like to come, Jeff. I really would. That's better. But I'll have to a courteous you. invitation makes it easy for everyone to decide if he can or wants to accept. If the invitation can't be delivered in person, the telephone can be used, and all the same courtesies apply. For example, it's nice if the person you're calling answers promptly. But this isn't always possible, so courtesy must go both ways. Give the person you're calling plenty of time to get to the telephone. If you don't phone, a written invitation is always courteous. Wait a minute, Jeff. Do you think Paul can read that? We can't even begin to get along with one another if we can't understand what each of us means. Speaking and writing clearly make it easier for others to understand us. So writing legibly is one of the simplest of courtesies. And don't forget to check to make sure you've included all the information necessary to make it easy for Paul to decide if he can or if he wants to accept. What it is, when it is, where it is, does it include a meal, anything else special, Exactly the same courtesies apply to the answer. Dear 
Jeff. I'll be there. Excuse me, Paul, but you'll be where? At your party. Yes, that's better. But what day and at what time? Now Jeff knows you are talking about the same party, and he also knows you have the date and time right. What he doesn't know yet is how you feel about being invited. Letting him know you're pleased is courteous, too. Now, George has a different problem. He got an invitation to Jeff's party, too. But you can't go, can you, George? Have something else to do? And you don't know what to say to Jeff? Well, just tell him you're sorry you can't make it. Call him. Courtesy doesn't insist you explain why you can't come, unless you really want to. Gee, George, I'm really sorry you can't make it. See? He understands. Thanks for calling. See you at school tomorrow. Jeff, is that the last of your guests? I haven't heard from Ted yet. Well, now look, Jeff. Unless your father knows how many are coming to the party, Jeff, he doesn't know how many tickets to get for the ball game. Oh, hi, Ted. Prompt replies to invitations make it easier for others to go ahead with their plans. All right, Jeff, here's your party. Can courtesy make it more pleasant? Happy birthday, Jeff. Gee, thanks, Paul. It's really great you could come. Come on, let's meet the other guy. This is Ted. This is Pete. This is Mike. Now those were wasted introductions. Let's try again, Jeff. Wait a minute. Paul, are you really paying attention or were you just trying to look interested? Based on the face and name person you're being introduced to. Paul, this is Mike. Now repeat Mike's name to make certain you heard it correctly. Mike, it's nice to meet you. Ted, I'd like you to meet my cousin Paul. Ted just moved here from New York. And he's a model shipbuilder too. Have you ever That was another courteous thing, Jeff. By letting your friends know they share a common interest, you've made it easier for them to get to know one another. Paul, I would like you to meet Pete. He's in my class at school. He's making a rigamajig for a science fair. What's it supposed to do, Pete? Cook hot dogs. Did anybody... When it's time to introduce your friends to your dad, you show respect by mentioning his name first. Great. Hi, Dad. I'd like you to meet some of my friends from school. That's Mike. Hi, Mike. Glad to know you. And this is Pete. He's in my room, too. Hello, Pete. I seem to recognize you from the football team. Yes. And this is Ted. Jeff adds just a few extra words to help everyone feel comfortable quickly. Do you live right around here? Jeff shows respect for his mother, too, by mentioning her name first. Mom, I'd like you to meet the boy I told you about from New York. Ted, meet my mother. I hope you brought a big appetite. It's time to eat. So far, we've seen a number of different ways that courtesy can make life easier and more pleasant. Let's see if there are still other ways. Thank you. Thank you. Simple courtesies. Here are some more. Everyone likes to know when something he's done has been appreciated. We can make life more pleasant for others by telling them of our appreciation. Great party, Jeff. It was my dad's idea about the ball game. Or sometimes just by showing it. There's no doubt that Paul appreciates the cake Jeff's mother baked. Being appreciative might even get you a second piece. Boy, this is great cake. 
Boys, it's time to go to the ball game. Now watch a few more ways of being courteous. Jeff's mom didn't ask for help, but it only takes a moment for Jeff's friends to pick up, and it makes it a lot easier for her. I guess Jeff was right. Ordinary, everyday courtesy is a way of doing things and saying things that make it easier and more pleasant for all of us to get along. It's a way of making each day a lot more fun for everybody. Yeah, maybe that was one of the most awkward birthday parties I've ever seen. <laughs> it's like nobody knew anybody. It was just like they were the kids were just standing there. Um, that is the magical utopian world of cornet films that hopes uh, that kids will behave each other. Um, you know, a film about courtesy, of course, is trying to create this illusion that kids can be courteous to each other, but come on, at a birthday party, people go, kids go nuts. Uh, speaking of going nuts, this next film is about uh, driving. The title got messed up, and obviously there was some sprocket damage at the beginning, but it does stabilize. It's called Look Who's Driving. <laughs> With the end of the day, Charlie's thoughts turn homeward. Hey, watch it! Don't do anything I wouldn't do, kid. Kid is right, you big overgrown. See you tomorrow, Charlie boy. <laughs> Charlie's right about Joe. He'll never grow up. Being grown up is a matter of accepting responsibility in all kinds of situations. Maturity isn't always measured by a person's age. but you didn't stop. But I had the right of way. I beg your pardon, the right of way was mine. It's mine, 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 it's mine. Now what makes them act that way? It's easy to see the mistakes of others when you set yourself a little apart. But it isn't always easy to set yourself apart. Charlie, Charlie, get a grip on yourself. What are you trying to do? Kill me? Charlie's going to win. Control, Charlie. Oh, yes, the car wouldn't hold the. No, hold Charlie. The... Control of yourself. Okay, what happened here? Officer, this guy was passing me real fast. See, then he runs right off the road. Well, 
Let's take a look down there. Am I dead? Charlie, you're in this shape because you didn't act your age. You don't blame me for... You blame Joe. Saw him as a big, overgrown kid. Irresponsible. Dangerous. See you tomorrow, Charlie boy. <laughs> but Charlie, it isn't only the Joes who are dangerous. There are moments when we all act like kids. It's human, but you're an adult. A grown man in a hurry to get home, impatient, keyed up. Yeah. And how about an idiot who does this to you? Sure, Charlie, he was at fault. But that was no reason for you to blow up. But that guy... Was that an excuse for going into a tantrum? But I'm not a... Anyway, it isn't only anger. It's anything that distracts us. Impatience, stubbornness, daydreaming, overconfidence, speeding, any of these uncalled for emotions. They can be murder behind the wheel. But I... I'm not like those others. It isn't those others, Charlie. It's you. It's everyone. No driver can afford to let his emotions drive him. When he does, he's like a child. And no child should drive a car. I couldn't help myself. Charlie, it's hard to be an adult. But at the wheel, you've got to be, if you want to stay alive. <laughs> Luckiest guy in the world. Turns his car over three times and walks away from it. Walks away? Walks away? I, I'm not... Then I'm not... I'm not... I'm alive! Oh, boy! Charlie! Oh, boy! Charlie, remember. Okay. Don't worry. Oh, Charlie, what on earth happened? Something that makes me wonder if I've really grown up. Well, that copy was a little beat up, um, but the animation was beautiful and the sentiment was nice. So Aetna, Aetna was the uh, insurance company. And Aetna was actually, it's interesting when you look at um, the history of driver's ed, in this country, you'll see that Aetna was there um, helping try to lobby for states to, to uh, have driving tests, to teach driver's ed. There's the these cool things called Aetna dri Drivo Trainers, which are these like cars that you, like these things that you sit in that have a, a gas pedal and a steering wheel, and they would project a 16 millimeter film of, you know, a driving situation, and then you would be graded based on how you worked your brakes and your gas and and all that stuff um my my dream is to find one of those and to you know have one running because i do have a drive trainer film um which i should i should find that somewhere it's uh, it's kind of interesting because it's in uh um it's uh it's meant to be widescreen so it's uh uh something i can't remember what the phrase is, but um, you use a lens and it makes it bigger. Uh, God, Mondays, man. Uh, this is a good time to say, like, coffee is a great way to reward AV geeks uh, and to get their memories into gear. Um, but anyways, yeah, Aetna was there, and they had a lot of educational films uh, that they were showing to try to educate drivers because they knew that educated drivers were less likely to be in car accidents. Um which meant that they didn't have to pay as much for insuring people. Uh, let's see, what time is it? 137. All right. Um, so I had somebody over the weekend request. Uh, they were looking for a bit actor or an actor who appeared in uh, the CBS series called You Are There. And what I didn't realize, I have lots of copies of You Are There. I didn't realize that there was like a 50s, 60s version. And then there was like an early 70s version. And I have... I have many of both. And so this one, uh, in watching a bunch of these films, trying to find this bit actor who is not credited, uh, I ran across uh, a couple of films, and they all feature celebrities that you know from other things. And it's so it's kind of interesting. Either celebrities who were kind of on their way down or celebrities that you didn't know yet. So uh, we're going to watch uh, 
this one. It is the uh, You Are There Siege of the Alamo. And if you're not familiar with the You Are There format, this was CBS News. They show a historic event, and they use reporters, and they kind of use the formatting like it's a news story. It's, it's kind of an interesting idea, um, and uh, I kinda, I'm kind of i kind of digging it. So, you are there. March 5th, 1836. The Mexican government has sent troops into Texas under the command of Mexican Chief of State, General Santa Ana. The troops are opposed by a small group of Texians. They're holed up in the Alamo mission. The Texians are greatly outnumbered. It seems doubtful that they can hold out unless they get help. And no one knows if this help will come before Santa Ana launches a full-fledged attack. The Mexican province of Texas is not a part of the United States, although it has been populated by a steady stream of Americans. These Texians, as they are called, are Mexican citizens. Their province is part of the Mexican nation, but their difficulties with the central government have steadily increased. Now there is open rebellion. March 5th, 1836. The Siege of the Alamo. You are there. The siege of the Alamo is now in its 12th day, and there is still no sign of reinforcements. CBS News correspondent Bob Schieffer is in the Alamo with the defenders. All things are as they were then, except... You are there. A new bombardment of the has just started and everyone is taking cover. These bombardments don't last very long, they aren't very accurate, but they are a constant reminder that there is an army outside these walls that can strike at any moment. Casualties! Casualties, any casualties? Sound out, anybody hit? The man asking about casualties is Colonel William Travis, who shares command of the garrison with Colonel James Bowie. But Bowie is taken very sick, and so Travis is assumed full charge. The man he's speaking to is Davy Crockett, the famous hunter, writer, and former American congressman from Tennessee. Colonel Crockett arrived to help out at the Alamo several weeks ago. You men all right? Not a scratch on them, Buck. How about this damage to the walls? Couple of stones knocked out, nothing we can't knock in again. Good. How are we doing on them messengers you sent out? They'll get through. Yeah. Bought him anyway. I sent him to see Fannin at Goliad and another man to Sam Houston in the Constitutional Assembly. Yeah, I wouldn't count on that bunch. They're politicians. All they'll send you back is a lot of hot air. That's why I'm counting on Fannin. He's got 400 men. We got 183. That's nearly 600 fighting men, Davy. There's a fellow out there with 3,000. Well, we got Davy Crockett on our side. That ought to even the odds. Let's go, Derek. Nice boy. Very nice. But awful young. How is he? Not good. Susanna Dickinson, wife of one of the men here who has been taking care of Colonel Bowie. I thought I might go in and try to cheer him up. With lies? You know, I saved a little piece of candy for that baby of yours. Hello, Jim. Any news? Well, I'm expecting Fannin any time now. Oh, don't count on Fannin. Goes by the book. Well, he won't let us down. Uh, he's West Point, always figuring the odds. Look, why don't you get yourself a little rest now? We're going to need you later. And if he does come, it is still three, four to one. We will be slaughtered. Mr. Rose, you sound like a man who has some suggestions. Perhaps we can escape in small groups over the walls at night. Our duty happens to be here. Your duty was to empty this place and leave. There is no chance. As long as men are willing to fight, there's a chance. 
You talk like a gentleman, and you'll die like one, looking for death, asking for it. I am no gentleman, I am a soldier. I was with Napoleon at Moscow. I see more men die than you ever see live. Well, I Mr. do Rose. not look to die, I look to stay alive. I learned when to fight and when to run away. It is time to run. No, Louis. There is no chance. Now listen, as long as we're alive, there's a chance. And as long as there's a chance, you're gonna fight. That does include you. Now get to your post. Suppose we don't get help? We will. So we come out here to make a new life. We're gonna make it, I promise. I wish we were back east. Honey, we decided. And we were right, you saw all the land out here. All of it, just for the taking. But there is plenty of other good land. But we're a country now. We don't belong to Mexico no more. We're Texians. We gotta fight them for that suit. But why? Because it's ours. He's sleeping. Colonel Travis? Yes, sir, what is it? Colonel Travis, is it true that you and Colonel Bowie were sent here to evacuate the Alamo? Well, uh, that was General Houston's advice, but you see, when we got here, we realized that it uh, wasn't the best course. Against such an overwhelming force? Yes, sir, for two reasons. You see, one is military. If we can stop Santa Ana here, he, uh, he can't proceed against us any, anywhere else. We'll have bought invaluable time to uh, organize and prepare and finally crush him. The other reason, sir? Hey, you hear that? Well, Santa Ana likes to shell us and then serenade us. He says it's real thoughtful. The other reason, sir? Sir, the enemy is advancing, 3,000 of them. And I cannot evacuate the Alamo and consider myself an honorable man. Now, will you excuse me? Three days ago, the Texians declared their independence from Mexico. And while the Alamo waits desperately for help, 150 miles away in the town ambitiously named Washington on the Brazos, the legislators of this new Republic of Texas are trying to hammer out a constitution. This is CBS News correspondent Dallas Townsend at Washington on the Brazos. General Sam Houston has arrived, and we understand he's been appointed commander-in-chief of the Texas Army. Most people believe that the convention will accept whatever advice General Houston gives them, especially in military matters. The man coming out of convention hall now is Lorenzo de Zavala, a Mexican, a former supporter of Santa Ana, who now has come over to the Texas side. Senor Zavala, has any decision been made about the Alamo? No, it's still being discussed. Talk. We can't save them with talk. We gotta move. Senor Zavala, in Mexico, you're considered a traitor. I am against the government. Can't you be against the government and remain in Mexico? Certainly, as a corpse. Then you feel you had no choice. Everyone has a choice. There is no longer democracy in Mexico. There's only a tyrant, Santana. He's the one who betrays Mexico. To fight against him is not to fight against my country, but for it. Here comes General Houston now. You asked now. me what I thought, and I told you. Well, this order is General all Houston, right. General all Houston. Right. All, all right, right. All, all right, right. All, all right. Now, that's enough. The matter's settled. General Houston, how is the matter settled? By letting brave men die. Your job is to stay here and create a government. There won't be any government at the Alamo Falls. Santa Ana will see to that. You leave Santa Ana to me, I'll leave the government to you. General, then you're not going to the Alamo? I'm going to Gonzales. It's on the way. Where I go from there depends on the situation. How many men are you taking with you, General? The same army I brought with me to this convention. And how many men is that? Four. My belt. I don't have an army. I'm going in the field to raise an army. If I had an army, I'd be at the Alamo now. General, is it true that you sent Jim Bowie with orders to evacuate the Alamo because you thought it couldn't be defended? That's right. Why weren't the orders carried out? 
Because Jim Bowie likes to fight better than he likes to think. Let's go. General, how do you intend raising an army? Well, I'm leaving that up to Santa Ana. What do you mean by that, General? Well, he's throwing 3,000 of his best troops against how many men at the Alamo? 200? There won't be an able-bodied man left in Texas who won't join me after hearing about that massacre. Then you think there will be a massacre? Well, there wouldn't have to be, not if they'd listen. But I guess you don't build a new country with men who listen. It's night now and very quiet here. No shots from the Mexican side, no sound at all. Only a deafening silence, a stillness that grows steadily more ominous. The Mexican troops can be seen now, just outside the range of the Alamo rifles. Looks like they're getting ready. We can still get away, Buck. Most of us. If you wish to leave, Mr. Crockett... Me and my boys could stay and give the rest of you cover. Look, it's not necessary. Fan and his men will be here soon. Whatever you say, Buck. Davy. Hmm? I'm sorry, I... What I said about you leaving. Oh, no offense, man. None taken. It's just that we came here for a purpose, and I don't want to betray that purpose, you understand? Listen. Not even the crickets are chirping. This is CBS News correspondent Douglas Edwards at General Santa Ana's headquarters. The general is out inspecting the troops. All that's needed now is the command to attack. The man making coffee here is the general's orderly, a former American slave named Ben. Excuse me, can you tell me where the general is now? It's taking a walk, I reckon, since everything's ready to go. An attack, you mean? I don't mean nothing. I'm just making coffee. You want some? No, thanks. There's plenty here. How does it feel, an American working for the Mexicans? Oh, that feels fine, just fine. Never been sick a day in my life. So, why don't you just have yourself a nice cup of coffee? That way I won't have to be making up a lot of fool answers and save us both a lot of trouble. Ten packs of cartridges for each grenadier. No more, no less. The walls are thick, and our cannons are light nine-pounders. Our General Gaona will be here in a few days with twelve-pounders. Why not wait? They reinforced the Alamo once. They could do it again. We will still have the advantage. There is never enough advantage when you're fighting madmen. They are still only men, however mad. They're willing to die when they, they know they could live. That is worth 50 cannon. No, we have waited long enough. General Santa Ana, do you think the rebellion can be crushed? It must be crushed. We have been tolerant with the settlers. We have given them land. Allow them to become Mexican citizens. We only ask a few conditions. No slavery, the acceptance of our religion. They came, now they rebel. They claim that you've changed the conditions. They break our laws. They smuggle slaves, evade custom duties, refuse to pay taxes. Still, your government has taken away many of their rights. Mexico cannot survive as a nation of separate provinces each with its own laws. Uh, General, some people see that as just an excuse for tyranny. I'm called a tyrant because I can see the future. Do you think Texas will remain an individual republic if it breaks away from Mexico? <laughs> Only a fool could think that. Sooner or later it will become part of the United States. Then Mexico will face a nation to the north even stronger than at present. I do not hate the Texans, but I will crush them for the survival of Mexico. 5 a.m. we attack. The men at the Alamo are still waiting for reinforcements, but time for them is growing very short. CBS News correspondent Bob Schieffer is still on the spot, and he'll bring us word of any developments. It's almost morning here at the Alamo. The night's been unusually quiet. There's been no shelling or other gunfire. There is also no sign of any help. Colonel Travis is still waiting for James Bonham, the messenger he sent to Colonel Fannin at Goliath. If Fannin arrives with his men, there is still hope. Do you think there's a chance, Colonel Crockett? With 16 bucks from Tennessee, son, you always got a chance. <laughs> you tell him, Davy. <laughs> well, back home when I go squirrel hunting, 
squirrels see me coming, they hop right out of the trees and call out, don't shoot, Davy, we're coming down. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you're not from Texas, Colonel. Uh, I'm not a colonel, son. I'm just sort of a high private. Hmm? <laughs> well, why are you here? Uh, well, son, when I come up for re-election to Congress last year, they all told me I was going to take a licking. So I said to them, if I wasn't going to be allowed to serve my country again, well, then my constituents could all go to blazes, <laughs> and I'd go to Texas. So here I am. Davy, I think you better get your men back to their post. Back to your post, boy. Davy. Don't worry about my boys. Just because they act sloppy don't mean they fight sloppy. Davy, when I first got here, I mean, we had to stay. Defend this place. Houston will know that. You know that. I mean, you came, didn't you? You wouldn't have come if you, uh, if you didn't think so. Well, I always figure the worst can happen is you get killed. And comes a time man's maybe ready for that. When he's done so much, been just about everywhere. Welcomed in high places. People following after him. Taking down what he says, writing it in the newspapers. And then one day, seems like overnight it happened so quick, they just don't want you no more. You can't figure out why, because you ain't changed. Guess you're like a guest. Stays too long at a party. You just wear out your welcome. And it's time to move on. I don't think there's any hope for reinforcements. There never was. Maybe we ought to try to escape. Bonham's coming! Davey Bonham's coming! Bonham, hey, Bonham, hey, come on, boy! James Bonham, the messenger they've been waiting for. Well, Benny won't come. Won't come? He says he's not prepared. But he's got 400 men. He started out and some wagons broke down. And he went back. I argued. I begged. I never begged for any man in my life. He said it'd be suicide. I want every man in Colonel Bowie's room. All right, boys. Let's go. There aren't going to be any reinforcements. In my opinion, that gives us three choices. We can surrender, try to escape, or stay and fight. For myself, I shall remain. But you're here as volunteers, and we will not keep anyone against his will. If anyone wishes to leave, let him do so now. Mr. Rose? Anyone else? Thank you. Louis, stay with us. I will take you with me if I could, Jim. Make it, but we shall see, no? to kill us all.
the Alamo fell on March 6th, 1836, every one of its defenders with it. Left alive were only Mrs. Dickinson and her 15-month-old daughter, several Mexican women, and Travis's slave, Joe. Louis Rose escaped with his life. Santa Ana lost almost a thousand men. But six weeks later, the army of Santa Ana met the newly raised army of Sam Houston at a place called San Jacinto. Houston's men went into battle shouting, Remember the Alamo. And when the battle was over, they had destroyed the Mexican army and captured Santa Ana himself. Texas became first a nation, and then on December 29, 1845, one of the United States of America. What sort of a day was it? A day like all days, filled with those events that alter and illuminate our times. And you were there. <laughs> There you go. What's interesting to me is that, um, so this was 1971 that came out, and my feeling is that, you know, I was a little kid then, I was like five, that there was probably also, you know, CBS News was also doing things about Vietnam and doing things about the Apollo mission. So CBS News was doing a lot of stuff. They were a big deal. It wasn't just, you know, CBS Sunday morning their morning shows and, you know, the news, there was a whole lot that they were doing. And it interests me to see, like, them using real correspondence, including a correspondent that shows up in some of the retrospect uh, civil defense films that I've been showing. Uh, I suddenly can't remember his name. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. You know, it's definitely dramatizing a historical thing, probably reinforcing some of the uh, incorrect things that we know about American history now. But um, it's, it's interesting nonetheless. You know, it's a way to contextualize and show things in a format that people are used to, which was a news uh, broadcast. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow, 1 o'clock, as always. And uh, if you like what you saw, please hit like and subscribe because those things seem to be important to somebody somewhere. I just like having you there and commenting and sharing with folks. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, you know, hitting like means something to somebody, but thanks. Uh, also, you can buy some coffee. Uh, coffee, caffeine is a way to, uh, uh, to reward us for our good behavior or punish us for our bad behavior. Uh, you can also go to avgeeks.com and buy uh, DVDs. Uh, and those of you following me on Twitter via Periscope, um, Periscope is going away, and I'm not quite sure how to broadcast to Twitter. Uh, and I'm trying to do research, and it's all very, very vague. So I'm working on that to maintain my Twitter, my Twitter followers. I mean, uh, there's got to be some way to do it directly to Twitter. Uh, but I haven't figured that out yet. So... Uh, anyways, everybody have a good rest of your Monday, and we will see you again tomorrow. Uh, as always, uh, we look inside the film can to see uh, what advice it gives us, and it tells us to love each other and to please rewind, and that always seems like good news, um, good advice. So everybody take care, and we'll see you again tomorrow. <laughs>